You would think after studying psychology for three and a half years at one of the top universities in the UK that I would feel pretty confident about speaking about how the brain works. But if I had to sum up what I've learned over the last three and a half years into one sentence, I'd say, the brain is complicated AF. But the problem with saying the brain is complicated AF is that it's not really very useful for people. You can't design around the notion that the brain is complicated AF, so we have to try and do better. And so in order to try and do better, psychologists have been trying for hundreds and thousands of years to create models of the brain and ways to think about how the brain works that are actually useful for people to use. Even thousands of years ago, the Bible indicated that there's a separation between the heart and the mind. And this really is our first indication that people understood that there seems to be two systems within the brain. There's one that thinks and there's one that's more emotional. Now really, the heart and the mind was the best model of thinking about the brain we had for many years until some psychologists later on tried to do it a bit better. It of course all started with Mr. Siggy Freudy back in the 1900s who proposed that our brain should be split into the id, the ego and the super ego and that persisted for a few decades until we get to the 60s where a guy called Roger Sparrow proposes that our brain should be split into left and right brain people. He proposed that our left brain was this analytical, logical, mathematical part of our brain whereas the right half of our brain was more creative, artistic, and emotional. And you can still hear people today saying, oh, I think I'm more of a left brain person or I'm thinking more of a right brain person, despite this theory of the brain being disproven for many decades already. Meanwhile, in more recent times, Pixar releases a movie called Inside Out, where the brain is portrayed as a committee of emotions that talk to each other to decide how the person should act. And honestly, in my informed scientific opinion, I don't think that any one of these models is more valid than the other, including the Pixar one. You see, they all kind of touch on how the brain is supposed to work, but they also all suck because they're all gross oversimplifications that aren't really that useful. But there's another model that I didn't mention and that is held very closely in the hearts of a lot of behavioral scientists, and it comes from this book over here, Thinking Fast and Slow. Of course, what I'm talking about is System 1 and System 2. So the way the theory goes is that System 1 is our fast way of thinking, whereas System 2 is our slow way of thinking. While for System 1, that's supposed to be the system that we use for most of our daily decisions. The decisions that are unconscious, the decisions that are automatic, but also the decisions that we're most likely to make errors on. Whereas for these other decisions, we have system two. System two is slower, we use it for more complex decisions, but system two is also the one that is conscious, that requires effort, but it's the one that we also think of as being more reliable. And this two system fast versus slow way of thinking has proven to be a very useful model for a lot of behavioral scientists and tends to be how behavioral economics and behavioral science is explained to people who have never been exposed to the field before. But despite the hype of system one and system two now, I wonder if we'll look back on this in 30 years time and just add system one and two to the pile of unused models that have been disproven and aren't actually useful compared to our current understanding. So to help me figure out if this is going to happen, I talked to my professor of neuroeconomics, Professor Elliot Ludwig, to see if there was any biological evidence for system one and two within the brain. So you're my neuroeconomics professor. How would you define neuroeconomics? What we're trying to achieve um, in the field is, um, you know, to try and understand behavior and decision making um, better by looking at what the brain, how the brain is involved um, in the process. So behavioral economists love the idea of system one and system two. In terms of how we divide the brain, how much of a biological basis is there for system one and system two? That's a really good question. Um, I think that there, there definitely is evidence that there are multiple decision-making systems in the brain. Um, and that there is pretty unambiguous. Um, although some people would argue that it's all one single valuation system and it all feeds in. So I, I, I think that that's to be debated still. Um, and my impression is that there does seem to be multiple decision-making systems. I, I think the idea that there's only two is probably not right. Um, I think that there's probably more ways that they can be, um, they can be thought of, right? As in there's probably what might be called system zero or a half or three or minus one even, um, that, that there's, a, there's more uh, 
there's more to it than just a simple intuitive system and a reflective system. On the one hand, there are many types of intuitive systems. There's many types of reflection. And there's, in some ways, system one and a half, right? There's a lot of continuity uh, between the two. And, and the distinction is not always obvious. Um, and, and there are, when, when you start to break it down and you try and start to push on you and you come to individual examples of what thing, you know, a particular behavior and how it's uh, implement, you know, how it's, carried out by the brain, you're like, okay, is that, you know, a system one? Is that a system two? It's not quite clear. And it's that lack of clarity that I think is the main point of this video, because when I look at the behaviors around me and I try and analyze them as a behavioral scientist, I very rarely see behaviors that fit nicely into this model of system one and system two. Let's take language, for example. When we communicate with each other, we deliberately choose the words that we want to use, and we deliberately choose the message that we want to deliver. But many of these things occur outside of our conscious awareness, things like the grammar and the structure of our sentences. We don't tend to think about those things when we're talking to each other. So when we talk about language, is that a system one process or a system two process? It really is very ambiguous. But then that begs the question, if so many of the behaviors around us don't seem to fit nicely into system one and system two, why is it that this theory has become so popular and why do these two system theories seem to pop up everywhere? Now, that idea is very, very widespread in psychology and neuroscience, right? The behavioral economics version is system one, system two, but into uh, controlled and automatic and goal-directed and habitual in the animal learning field. Um, and in, my, in one of my areas in computer science, we talk about model-free and model-based reinforcement learning as, as two of, one of these types of distinctions. So it seems very easy. It seems that maybe it's more of a reflection of our cognitive apparatus as a way of understanding the world of splitting things into two types um, that it's kind of the first cut you look at something you say okay well you know there's there's two parts um, but maybe there's three or four and um, but it feels like the system one system two distinction is actually a property of our cognition that that's one of the ways that we try to understand the world is by um, sometimes breaking into, two, you know, categorizing things in two. So if I had to sum up the main message of this video, I'd say that while system one and two do have some biological evidence within the brain, that they're not an all-encompassing theory about understanding human behavior. Because they're an oversimplification, trying to fit a square behavior into a round theory is only going to lead to some pretty messy results. Instead, I think using system one and two can be useful, but only in the right context. So think of it as a tool in your toolbox or a lens in your magnifying glass when analyzing a human behavior, but don't think that system one and two is going to be applicable to all behaviors that you're dealing with, because it definitely won't. So guys, if you liked today's video or you learned something new, please can you give me a thumbs up down below because it really helps me out, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.